lecture by uh, Joseph Stiglitz the other day, former chief economist of the World Bank and a Nobel laureate. And he said that um, lowering cap uh, corporate tax rates and uh, expecting them to invest is fundamentally wrong. Fundamentally, but fundamentally wrong. And his, he, uh, from memory, these are the, so the prescriptions that he, he gave. He said that to raise corporate taxes on corporations, uh, raise taxes on corporations that don't invest, uh, tax the financial sector, uh, reduce or eliminate corporate welfare, um, and ensure, obviously ensuring multinational, multinationals pay all, the ta all their tax. And also he said to uh, increase taxes on corporations that produce negative externalities. He also is against austerity. And he, uh, um, and even the, uh, according to Yanis Varoufakis, who I was also listening to, he says that uh, even the IMF's own analysis reveals that austerity is very destructive to an economy. So would you like to comment on all those points? I'd love to do so, um, because I, I, I've spent a life in the economics profession, <laughs> and I'm very interested when fairly senior figures who you might expect to support conservative positions swing over to uh, more critical and progressive positions. I think in many respects it echoes what Jim Stanford was saying in his uh, address, that the, the old orthodoxies are crumbling mm. and that people like uh, Joseph Stiglitz and Paul Krugman, who are by no means radicals, are now swinging over to support generally progressive points of view about taxation, about the link between addressing inequality and increasing productivity. Uh, reports from the uh, International Monetary Fund are showing that uh, equality is good for economic performance. In other words, the old notion that I was schooled in as a mainstream economist about the inherent efficiency equity trade-off, mm. mm. you know, now seems to be uh, being discarded by main respectable figures in the economics profession. So I, 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 I'm actually deeply unsettled by this. I've, <laughs> I've, I've, I've spent my professional career uh, challenging these guys, uh, and, I, and I don't think for one moment it's arguments from the likes of me and my colleagues that have won them over. I think there's something to do with the changing material circumstances, changing evidence, yes, yes. Uh, as, as Malcolm Fraser once said, you know, or no, no, sorry, not Malcolm Fraser, John Maynard Keynes said, uh, you know, when circumstances change, uh, I change my views. What do you do? <laughs> then if you've talked about uh, the programs on uh, business as usual, but how will this new government respond to business as usual, namely, what if a GFC USF prime prices hits Australia? What do you think their reactions will be? Because I'm pretty much concerned at the direction in which Government seems to want to take control and ownership of your savings, your money. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure they're going to bail out of corporations. And I'm also sure that income and wealth inequalities will increase by their very moves. But I might be wrong. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a timely question, friend. Uh, there was something out today, I don't know if you saw it, from... Um, uh, from the prudential regulator about the um, number of bad loans or non-performing loans out there and it's taken a significant turn up yep. sorry it's taken a significant turn up in the last uh, couple of quarters uh, across Australia especially in WA and Northern Territory that have been hardest hit by the resource collapse but even elsewhere and the degree of indebtedness of uh, households is enormous 125 percent of GDP Jeez. And uh, it is the culmination of this kind of self-reinforcing debt, credit, real estate spiral, you know, where the price goes up, interest rates are low so I can borrow enough to afford it, but that builds the price up even further, which then leads you to borrow even more money, and it's a kind of a, 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 hamster, a hamster wheel kind of effect. Um, another dimension of fragility in the Australian case is the high foreign debt 
Australia's foreign debt is over one trillion dollars. Much of it denominated in foreign currency rather than Australian currency, which means if there was a, a shock or a crisis of some kind here, perhaps uh, a big change in housing prices, then you're likely to see a significant decline in the currency, but that is going to make it harder to pay back foreign loans that are denominated in other currencies, and it's also going to shock the confidence of foreign lenders who would uh, lend money to finance the continuing current account deficit uh, and so on. So even from an Australian perspective, let alone a global perspective, there's considerable fragility in the financial system, but less to fall back on if GFC Part 2 happens uh, again, which I tend to think it will at some point. Uh, so the response at that point could be pretty dramatic. You could see, uh, that's when you might see the gloves come off and see the government really come uh, charging with an austerity type of uh, provision, which would be a disaster economically and socially. Um, preferably, if we've got a vision of our own that's ready to go at the time, uh, that would involve nationalizing, nationalizing the banks or, or uh, taking under public control credit creation and use, integrating that with the sort of jobs and investment program that Frank's already outlined, then maybe we'd have a chance to, uh, to make something positive out of it. But uh, I think your point about the financial fragility and the fact that we're already in a weak state. Think of, you know, the GFC hit in 2008 at the end of the mining boom. So Australia had some reserves to fall back on. That's no longer yes, the case yes, today yes. if it happens again. Yes. Yeah. I, I'll just add a, a, just one little footnote, which is a reminder that Kevin Rudd's government was in power when the GFC hit first time in 2008-2009 and uh, we were very successful in avoiding recession mm -hmm. precisely because the Rudd government carried out Keynesian economic policies. Yes, yes. the circumstances yes. had changed and they did require uh, a government expenditure to be increased. Uh, even at a time when governments were still concerned with trying to balance the budget, they thought, no, the first priority here has to be to pump up the level of spending in order to offset the likelihood of recession. Now, if there's a Turnbull government in power when a GFC hits, the situation is much more difficult because can he carry his party, including those uh, right wingers in the party, along with a program of Keynesian economics? Good question. I suspect not. Good question. Good question. Um, my question is, it kind of was half asked actually. I, I'm, I'm quite worried about the level of Australia's private debt, which I think is the highest in the world, is it not? It's 1.7. Two, private, two times private debt is GDP, high, yeah. Yeah, yeah, which yeah. is so the government mm -hmm. debt is down, but in the economics books, mm -hmm. they never measured private debt because it was assumed that it was relatively trivial. And I think maybe that's a tradition mm -hmm. in economics. I, I don't know. I don't know enough about economics to answer that. But the there's now a huge private debt, which is basically because because of our tax system, we've declared our houses are worth twice what they were worth ten years ago, when in fact they're the same houses. So all we've done is increase our national indebtedness at a private level rather than a public level. Mm. And we can't export very well because our wages are too high. So we're actually buying trivial goods, like expensive coffees and hair, haircuts, while in fact the money is actually seeping out of the country, it seems to me, and there isn't a mining income. Are we in danger of a major collapse? And what, how would that progress and what, uh, what could be done about it? I mean, I guess the, the infrastructure spending versus the austerity is the, the thing you've alluded to. But how likely is this collapse? How would it, would it take effect and what would it actually do? Well, you, you've pointed out the, um, the elephant in the room, which is the end of the mining boom and uh, everything that it meant. Um, obviously, it wasn't sustainable in any sense, economic or ecological but it did generate a lot of export revenue. A lot of money flowed into the country, both the proceeds on the exports and investment coming in for those big projects. And it did fuel, it did fuel the boom for a, a few years. That mining boom is dead and buried now and it isn't coming back, you know. I remember um, growing up in Alberta, uh, the mining and petroleum area of Canada, and seeing a bumper sticker that said, 
Please God, let there be another oil boom, and I promise not to piss it all away this time. <laughs> and, and that might as well be the bumper sticker here because it's not going to happen again. There's no way it's going to happen again. That unique set of circumstances in the 2000s. And now we're in a situation where private investment is, is, I don't know if I'd say collapsing, but falling dramatically because of the huge importance of those mining projects which, uh, which are, uh, are now shrinking. So there is a fundamental structural weakness in Australia's position, uh, and we're starting at a, uh, from a fragile place. So you know, it, kind of, it reinforces the, the discussion we just had to the previous question. Where is uh, investment going to come from? Well, it's going to have to come from other places. It's going to have to come from a, a positive, green, public-private investment strategy, you know, that marshals public investment in key sectors, in targeted sectors, that does things that, as Stiglitz suggested, that reward private investment rather than rewarding cash hoarding by companies, that focuses on job creation as the top goal, uh, that uses equality as a, uh, uh, as a supportive... Uh, a supportive engine for the thing. That there's, there's more and more reasons every day why we need to enunciate and promote that kind of a vision. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for tonight's uh, very interesting and entertaining uh, lectures. Uh, Graham Bowers, Mark. This morning, the Herald, uh, or Fairfax, nominated a $900 million loss by writing down the value of its paper printing business to effectively zero. Uh, without knowing anything in detail about taxation, I take it that this will relieve Fairfax of taxes for the next umpteen years. Is, is this the way for business to cop out in uh, the way that uh, Fairfax has just shown? We need a tax expert to answer that question, but I think the answer is no, that a write-down in the value of assets doesn't have a direct bearing on your tax liabilities. And I might say in this case, it's probably in tune with what's actually happening in media. Right. I mean, uh, the, the value of equipment used for printing newspapers is probably declining in value as newspaper sales decline, right. uh, as online platforms take over from conventional news outlets. Uh, so I, I suspect it's A, sensible, and B, not primarily a taxation minimization <laughs> uh, strategy. <laughs> Uh, but but you really need someone from the ATO here to say, to, <laughs> to say what what are the regulations which allow uh, profits to be uh, you know taxable profits to be adjusted in exactly. the light of exactly. changing values uh, of assets. They've been sacked. They've been sacked. That, uh, that that's an excellent yeah. question. Yeah. It, as Frank has said, it depends what assets are being written off, and it's whether those assets are allowed to be written off against taxable profits paid to the taxman. Not all, not all the accounting entries there will be uh, free of tax, okay? They're, they're, some of them will have to be taxed. Uh, and of course, we all know what the state, uh, the, media industri the media industry is in Australia, as it is in other parts of the world too, especially the print industry. Next question. Chris Thomas, my name. Uh, industrializing the banks. Uh, at a time when there's been a lot of discussion about the banks and a lot of concern, the issue of nationalising hasn't come up in any of the, the media that well, might be regarded as more, more fair-minded than the Australian or the Daily Telegraph and, and so on. Now, has anybody noticed anything in any mainstream media about nationalising the banks? No, there there has not been, I think, any significant discussion about uh, about that solution. Now, there are some intriguing ways in which something that's broader than that, I would call socialization of credit as opposed to nationalizing the institution of a bank, but finding instead ways to um, 
ways to find other systems for creating credit and purchasing power and distributing it into the economy, there's uh, some interesting opportunities there because of the failure of conventional monetary policy to solve the problems that are out there. So you now have the funny situation of central banks in many c countries around the world, you know, again, not being socialists, but arguing we have to create credit and distribute it directly into the economy through what they often call now helicopter money, you know. And it's a slippery slope, frankly, one that we should take advantage of because it challenges uh, the kind of property rights assumptions that normally go into the idea of liabilities um, and credit creation uh, and so on. So I think there's huge potential to develop a positive, progressive vision of the financial system. And if we ended up with a, a royal commission into the banks, I would not want it to just focus on banks are big and profitable, therefore they're evil, you know, because uh, the implication of that is, well, you should bust them up and have small private banks which frankly is going to be worse. No, no you're right. You're yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. What we need to Yeah, we need to talk about ways of collectivizing yes. this unique power that has been granted to banks, including credit unions, public banking, and super maybe nationalize, you know. Superannuation. The mm -hmm. the superannuation funds is another potential vehicle, mm -hmm. alternative public investment funds. Think of things like the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, yes. which is like a public investment bank, which is a, a wonderful idea and has actually done very good things. Uh, that principle could be broadened uh, quite dramatically. So taking this away from bash the big nasty banks, which is where it's at right now, to uh, a complete understanding of the problems of private credit and how can we use public or democratic credit to put ourselves back to work. Excellent. That would be a big opportunity, I think. Mm. Just add one reflection. Uh, I mean, Jim's list of uh, how attitudes have changed I mean, it may be that bashing big banks is part of that process of changing attitudes about what kind of financial institutions mm -hmm. we want that will serve a public interest. I mean, I'm really old-fashioned on these questions. I think, you know, banks are actually should be a fairly modest feature of an economic landscape. You know, the depositors put their money in their banks and people who want to buy houses or expand businesses go to banks uh, in order to get loans. In other words, a very old-fashioned notion of banks as a sort of intermediary between borrowers and lenders. Uh, but of course they've developed a whole array of functions which make that, that traditional function rather marginal to, to their principal interests in generating profits for shareholders. I mean, they're huge speculative institutions in their own rights, creating money, engaging in all kinds of arbitrage activities, financial speculation, creation of new financial products. Yep. I mean, it, it, it's a... It, Frankly, I've spent a lifetime in economics, and I don't understand what's going on. So I think a royal commission could actually be very helpful, not just as a bank bashing exercise, but to increase public understanding and awareness yes. of what yes. banks are actually doing. And then we might be able to move on to this broader, more progressive uh, perceptions that, that, that Jim's been talking about, and we might then be able to put a tick against that on his list too. Okay, I'm interested in your ideas about an alternative social and economic plan, a counter-hegemony of ideas, a counter-narrative. Okay, Malcolm Turnbull extols in his vacuous rhetoric the opportunities of building an innovative nation based on embracing the opportunities flowing from digital disruption, technolo technological change, computerization and automation which the Committee for the Economic Development of Australia, CEDAR, predict will disappear over 5 million jobs in the next 15 years. Meanwhile, employers are increasingly meeting their labour requirements through the creation of unstable, part-time and precarious jobs. This guy standing, the social scientist, argues that the so social divide of the 21st century is between those with secure employment, a diminishing number, and the casualised, subcontracted, outsourced, uberised rest, the precariat. Guy Standing, along with the economist Martin Wolf, argued that the, a basic income guarantee, a universal guaranteed income for all, working or not,
casualised or permanent is absolutely essential to maintain levels of real effective aggregate demand and to break the cycle of overproduction and underconsumption. And some have also said like the, the amount that we spend on 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 maintaining the concessions for wealthy superannuants, if we abolish those concessions, that would that's equal to the amount that we currently uh, spend on age pensions. We, we could, if we abolish those concessions, we could reduce the age age pension level, the, the age for age pension eligibility, and that would be, form the basis for a UBI, a, a unconditional basic income, which is now being trialled in many countries over the, overseas. Hmm. Uh, that's an sure. example of innovation that I'd like to see in Australia as a counter narrative as well. Yeah, yeah. All right, that, that, I take that as a comment. Uh, uh, yeah, I'd like to comment on the comment uh, because I, <laughs> I, I think it's a good comment. And, uh, I'd certainly, the, the universal basic income is an idea whose time is coming, I think. There are already some experiments occurring in some European countries. Canada, I think, has had a little bit of a regional experiment too. Uh, and uh, it seems to have a certain logic. In an affluent society, we should not tolerate poverty, and one means of doing that is not through selectively targeting social payments, but by providing an across-the-board universal basic income. Uh, look, I mean, it's expensive, depending on the level at which it's set, and it can possibly have work disincentive effects, but maybe that's not a big issue in a society that's increasingly technological and capital intensive. Maybe we don't all need to be working 35 hours a week in order to have a good standard of living. Uh, so, in other words, the distributional question becomes increasingly important as the production question in economics is solved. Yes. So, uh, so, and this is one means of dealing with that distributional question that certainly scores high marks for social equity, fairness, social solidarity. And as Bertrand Russell said almost exactly 100 years ago, it would also be very good for the artistic community. Well said. Jim? No, I'm good. Uh, Frank, I'm going to... Uh, into demonising unions. Oh, hang on. Uh, not all of the unions who are engaged in the, uh, in, in the sort of discussion that you're talking about, but those unions who escape their responsibilities to do with the uh, to and fro in the economy, to uh, feather their nest in governing the Labour Party. They are the ones, in, in my view, who are keeping the Labour Party more neoliberal than, the, than it would otherwise, otherwise be. Yeah. But look, I do want to go a step further. Um, whenever there's a discussion about infrastructure, in, in my, one's mind one always thinks about railways and Eden roads and other infrastructure of that, of that ilk. Um, and there's a, then there's a reference to education and health. Um, without um, really starting to develop a view about what the social infrastructure needs to be. Um, we sort of speak about education and health as though everybody understands what it is. Now, further steps have been taken with regard to university education, but school education really goes beyond a Gonski proposal that more resources be made available, not about the nature of the educational program that takes place. And then there's a very significant economic or structural feature, and that is that the workforce tends to be female in the welfare sector and depressing the welfare sector, that's health, education and welfare sector, uh, is one of the ways, I'm, I'm sorry, it's one of the ways in which the um, difference between male and female uh, incomes is maintained, in fact, 
is the, is the difference between the salary and you know, the wages of men and women actually increasing rather than decreasing because of this this impact and it's part of the conversation that we're going to be going into. Yes, I'm not. I I I won't say anything further about the relationship of the Labour Party to the unions, except uh, Jim probably knows more about that, but it is very complex because the unions don't speak with a single voice. There are left unions, right unions, I mean the teachers fed you know more about than I will ever know. But it's, uh, I, I perceive as an outsider that it's been a fairly progressive influence on, on, on the issues you've described. And certainly I think Broadly speaking, this is another element in Jim's list where there's a bit of a tick, albeit with a question mark. Occupations in which women are a principal uh, element, dominant element within the, the workforce, have gained increasing legitimacy over time. I mean, think nurses. I mean, they're, they're a, a, a powerful and increasingly well-paid uh, sector within the workforce. The notion that this is sort of women's work in the home just extended into the public sphere is now long gone. And, and certainly the same for teachers, for people engaged in social work. Uh, my partner's a social worker. I mean, there's no suggestion that she's a, a second-class citizen. She's a uh, a legitimate and important professional worker and uh, so I think there have been great strides forward in the areas in which you describe. Always more to be done but I think you've touched on some, some issues that also are you know, on, on, on the agenda and in which there is scope for further progress. My background is from the technical industry. Now my question is in this day and age of uh, digitisation and especially post um, Tony Abbott government, there's been a, a pseudo um, austerity policy to sort of strip our resources and funding in the real economy. And that includes also education, uh, the health sector, but also things like the environmental and renewable energy sector. My question is, uh, a lot of our leaders have a tendency to avoid, the, the, they seem to be in Australia in the background, an intentional approach of stripping out people who've got past experience or would have had succession planning and passing on that knowledge to the youth, and that's been truncated. But at the same time, we're seeing a significant uh, neglect of um, industries to pretty much die out slowly and not replace them. So in terms of re reversing that, especially in the changing environment of um, both the natural environment but also in economics and um, um, uh, like say the 21st, 21st century economy, how will those changes be able to be reversed or um, improved? Because uh, a lot of the industries today are relying on government spending and yet the government's actually been restricting their spending. And so all that innovation coming from the bottom up is being stifled by a lack of policy from the bottom down. Now is that due to more through government policy? Will it be through smaller parties sort of having more of a push? Is an economic issue, a political issue, or do we need some sort of major shock which could even lead to war to be able to sort of change the sort of thinking? Well, that's a really, uh, a really rich uh, question, and uh, we're all scratching our heads uh, about how it all connects together, because you're quite right, it does connect together. And, you know, I, I think we've got a responsibility. I don't know if this is really an answer to the, to the point, but it's sort of where my head is at these days when I look around at Brexit and Pauline Hanson and Trump and uh, I look at the failure of neoliberalism all over the place, a failure of neoliberalism all over the place, but also the failure of the left to posit a, a narrative about why it happened and what we can do differently. Yes. Yes. And, um, you know, the, just the way that you've indicated how things could fit together in a very terrible way, I, I can totally see how that could happen. You know, especially now that we've had the GFC and several years of non-recovery from the GFC and people are already tired and have suffered a lot and something else bad happens then you are going to see an intensification of uh, xenophobia and racism and division and militarism um, so you know I think that makes it all the more important for us collectively and in, in all of our different ways and Frank outlined it perfectly all our communities and our movements and our organizations to work collegially and constructively and innovatively to come up with a, a vision of a different way that we can take people's idle labor power 
their brains and their brawn, their capacity to work, their willingness to work, and marshal that, which is the driving force of any economy, that's the reality, marshal that to, to lift our living standards and protect our environment. And uh, if we can do that in a convincing way, we can have another era of um, dramatic positive social change as we've experienced in the past because the system is weak right now. For years it seemed to us the system was strong and how are we gonna, how are we gonna make any change? Today the system is weak and it's up to us to, to come up with a way to, 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 to fundamentally push it. Yeah. Marshalling, organizing, and pulling it together. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we should put our hands together to thank our speakers.